Basics of Bonding, Chapter 8, Segment 3. So we're moving right along. We were talking about Lewis structures, Lewis dot um, structures for atoms. Then we looked at diatomic molecules. Um, now we're going to move into more complex molecules. So many nonmetals will form more than one covalent bond. So for instance, if we look at carbon, carbon has four single electrons. That's the potential to form four single bonds. Um, nitrogen has three single electrons in one pair. Again, we'll tend to form three bonds. Oxygen, we know, will form two bonds. And of course, we give you some basic structures with hydrogen there. We have methane, ammonia, and water. Now, we've only been focusing on single bonds, but we can do more than one bond. So a single bond was when we shared a single pair of electrons. Now, many molecules can share more than one pair. So that means we're going to have multiple bonds. And so the first thing we have up would be double bonds. So now we're going to share two pair. That's how we come up with double. So two atoms will share two pairs of electrons. For instance, let's take a look at CO2. So here we can see the carbon in the middle. Um, it's got four single electrons. It's going to share two electrons with what we'll call oxygen number one. And it's going to share two electrons with oxygen number two. So you can see now we have four electrons in the middle. And so that means those four electrons are being shared with that oxygen, the second set of four electrons being shared with the second oxygen. And don't forget, because carbon also put two electrons into each one of those bonds, it gets to count those two bonds as well. Okay, so of course when we go to draw it out now, since it's a double bond, instead of having one line, now we have two lines. Right, so each line representing a pair of electrons. Now we can also have a triple bond, and that means that three pairs of electrons are going to be shared between two atoms. So for instance, if we look at nitrogen as a diatomic, nitrogen has three electrons um, in its outer shell that are single, and it can use for bonding. And so it's going to make three pairs of electrons. And so here we can see those three pairs get shared with both nitrogen one and nitrogen two. All right, which species is most likely to have multiple bonds? CO, H2O, PH3, BF3, and CH4. So the trick here is figuring out which atom is what we call the central atom. So here we know carbon would be the central atom, and carbon should make four bonds, but it only has one thing bound to it. So if it only has one thing bound, then that means we're probably going to have some multiple bonds there. Hydrogen cannot be the central, so oxygen has to be the central, and oxygen will form two bonds, and lo and behold, we have two hydrogens. Typically, the central atom is written first. Here, water has always been H2O. We don't call it OH2. Um, and so, you know, some things came before the rules of nomenclature, so to speak. So pH3... We know P would be central. It's just like nitrogen. It has one lone pair. It should make three bonds. We have three hydrogens. Boron, boron only has three dots. So it looks like it should take on five or even lose these three. And that's exactly what's going to happen. Notice it's BF3. So the fluorines are going to attach and basically take those. Now, Boron chemistry is a little crazy as far as following rules, but in this case, we would expect all those to be single bonds. And then, of course, the CH4, we know C should have four bonds. Here we have four hydrogens, which means the species we'd expect to have multiple bonds, as we thought right at the beginning, would be A, CO. All right, so once we start sharing electrons, we start to ask questions like, are they being shared evenly? And of course, that's going to bring up electronegativity and bond polarity. So when we look at hydrogen, hydrogen here, we know that both of those should be about the same. And so they're going to share equally. But if we look at HCl as a gas, there's more electron density around the chlorine than the hydrogen, which means they're not being shared equally. And in fact, the chlorine has what we call a partial negative charge. And here you can see we represent that with a little delta negative. And then, of course, if that's partially negative, 
then the hydrogen has to be partially positive. So two atoms of the same element form a bond. We have equal sharing. Two atoms of different elements form a bond. We have unequal sharing. Okay. Now, what's drawing this? What's, why is this doing this? Well, one atom usually attracts electrons more strongly than the other. That result then is a shift, an unbalanced distribution of electron density. In other words, the chlorine here wants the electron more than the hydrogen does. And so it's going to end up being partially negative. Its electron cloud then will be tighter around the Cl in HCl. Slightly positive charge then would be found around the hydrogen, slight negative around the chlorine. Now remember, this is not a transfer though. The electrons are still being shared. They're just not being shared equally. <clears throat> this is going to lead to those partial charges. So that partial negative and partial positive. Okay. Now the partial positive on hydrogen is a plus 0.17. The partial negative on the chlorine is going to be a negative 0.17. Now I know what you're saying. Where do we get those numbers? All right. Polar covalent bonds. So our polar covalent bond is also known as a polar bond. And again, this is going to be a bond that carries a partial positive and a partial negative. And automatically that means the bond is going to have a dipole. Now, that means we're going to have a polar bond. Okay? That doesn't mean we're going to necessarily have a polar molecule. So we'll get into some of that as well. But by saying we have a dipole, it simply means we have two poles because we have two charges involved, right? So we have a positive pole and a negative pole. All right, to have a polar molecule, it will require a polar bond. So molecule has a partial positive and negative charge at opposite ends of a bond, okay? So just because we have a polar bond does not mean we're gonna have a polar molecule. But in order to have a polar molecule, we have to have a polar bond. Now, what's a dipole moment? Because we just said we have a dipole. And typically I find in 150, um, we have a high concentration of engineers. So engineers, you've probably worked with moments. Um, in your classical mechanics course, you would force, have forces would have moments. A dipole moment is simply a force that's gonna be generated by that dipole. So quantitative measure of extent to which the bond is polarized. So we can actually put a number on how much polarization we have. And if the polarization is large enough, then we form a dipole moment. So the charge on either end times the distance between them. So mu is equal to Q times R. The units are usually measured in Dubai, which is a capital D. And one of those is a very, 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 very small Coulomb meter. Okay. The size of the dipole moment or the degree of polarity in the bond depends on the differences and abilities of bonded atoms to attract electrons to themselves. Whew. Okay, so what does that really mean? What that means is, is that when we look at the periodic table, the periodic table is going to give us a value of what we call electronegativity. Each atom on the periodic table, it's been measured to how much it wants the electrons. So if I make a covalent bond between two atoms, we can literally measure who wants the electron more based upon IEs, um, so ionization energies and electron affinities. Now with that information, if I get two different atoms together with two different values, the change in that difference is going to tell us how big that pole is. The bigger that pole is, the more Debye's. The more Debye's, the more the, the larger the moment is. Okay, that's complex, but simple at the same time. All right, which situation below results in the largest dipole moment? So again, if you want to go back and look at your math, mu, that's the dipole moment, is equal to Q times R. So we're looking at the difference in charge on either end times the distance between them. So plus one and minus one charges separated by six angstroms, plus one minus one by eight angstroms, plus two minus two by four angstrom, plus two minus two by six angstrom, plus two minus two by eight angstrom. 
Well, we already know it's going to be the larger differences in charges, so plus 2, minus 2. And then the greater the distance, the greater the moment. And so it's going to be E, right? Remember, mu is equal to Q times R, so the dipole moment increases as both Q and R increase. So dipole moments and bond lengths for some diatomic molecules. You can notice the trend here. So we have HF, HCl, HBr, HI, right? So all plus 1, minus 1. Fluorine is the most electronegative, and so you can see the dipole moment then is going to increase um, with it. So it's going to decrease as we go down the list. So here we see HCl is only 1.1, HBr 0 0.83, 0.45. Now let's look at the bond length. The shorter that bond is, right, the bigger the moment is, which is kind of not what you're expecting, right? It should be opposite of that. It's what we were just looking at. So what else is going on in here? So this is plus one minus one, plus one minus one, plus one minus one, plus one minus one, right? If we look at plus two, so this is plus three minus three, and plus three minus three as well, no, excuse me, plus two minus two, plus two minus two. So we have um, 0.11 for the moment, but only a bond length of 113. So as that moment is getting smaller, it looks like the length is getting longer. I don't see the consistencies here. We have 161, 141, 127. So the bond length is getting longer as the dipole moment gets smaller for the plus one minus one. All right. Again, you don't have to memorize any of these numbers. So let's look at electronegativity because that data table seems to go opposite of what this one's telling us, right? So Q is supposed to be equal, excuse me, mu is supposed to be equal Q times R. But as that length gets longer, the dipole moment's actually going down. Well, electronegativity is the driving force behind all of this. So this is the relative attraction of atoms. Remember I said you can assign a number. The quantitative basis for this, and of course if you have the textbook, you can go to figure 8.9, it gives you some electronegativities. If you don't have the textbook, just go to Google, type in electronegativities, um, and then pick images, and 99% of the time there'll be a bunch of periodic tables there that give you those values for each element. So once we have those electronegativities, and you don't have to memorize any of those numbers, we can take that difference between those electronegativities, and that's going to give us approximately the estimate bond polarity. So delta En is going to equal En minus 1, or 1 minus En minus 2, excuse me. Ah, try that again. The change in the electronegativity will equal the absolute value of En1 minus En2, right? So the electronegativities of the first atom minus the second atom. If I have several bonds in a molecule, this calculation is per bond. Okay, so it's only talking about the electronegativity in that one bond, not for the whole molecule. So for example, if I wanted to do NH or SIF, I could go get those values. And the values here, so if we see F is 0.1, right? So we have, let's see, N, H, S, I, and F. So H is 2.1, F is 4.1. So we said H was 2.1, F we said was 4.1. We need S, I, and N. So S, I, 1.8, N, 3.1, so 3.1, 1.8. So now when we look at these differences, all right, now remember this is not the whole molecule, NH, all right? This could be ammonia, which would have three hydrogens on it. But when we do this bond measurement, we're literally just measuring this one right here. And so we're going to take 3.1 minus 2.1. It's going to have a magnitude of 1.0. That means this side is going to be partially negative because its value is larger. So the En is larger. So if the electronegativity is larger, that's where the electrons want to spend their time. And so here, the electrons are going to spend their time on the nitrogen, which means that density is going to be heavier there. For SIF, remember, SI is in group 4A, which means it actually wants four bonds. Right? It's trying to use four electrons. It's only using one in this bond. Uh, 
but this one bond would be polar towards the fluorine. So all the electrons want to be with fluorine. And again, you don't have to memorize that table. We'll provide this for you. You know, we'll give you whatever electron, um, electronegativities you need for that. So your trends, EN increases from left to right across the period. And again, you can imagine this is directly related to the Z effective. EN decreases from top to bottom down as the N increases. So as the atoms get extra shells, then we see the electronegativity will also drop. Remember, it's a measure of how much the atom wants an electron. So kind of going in, we know fluorine is going to be the most electronegative. We know francium on the opposite end should be the least electronegative, all right? Now, we kind of set this up that there's two types of bonding, ionic and covalent. And then you might have even kind of come to the conclusion that there's at least three types, right? Because we have ionic, there's covalent, but there's also polar covalent. Realistically, this is a sliding scale from ionic to covalent. So if I go back and I take a look at this, we can see francium here is 0.9 and fluorine was 4.1, right? That's gonna be the largest difference right there. Okay, so 0.9 and 4.1. But we know that francium fluoride should be an ionic salt, okay? So ionic and covalent bonding are actually the two extremes, but there actually is stuff that happens in between, okay? So that's the polar covalent, and the covalence. So really what you want to think of it as is we could have an ionic bond at one extreme, covalent at the end, and polar covalent would be a measurement in the middle. And again, you can kind of think of this as a sliding scale, where if I take francium and fluorine, we subtract those, right? So we had 4.1 minus 0.9. So we get what? 3.2 down on this end and zero down on this end, okay? Typically, we say anything greater than two. So greater than two is gonna be ionic. And then anything from 0.5. And again, this 0.5, it's really just a rule of thumb. It's very arbitrary, okay? So 0.4 would be considered covalent, 0.5 would be polar covalent. But again, it's it's a gray area, and I don't want you to think of it as it has to be this one or that one. It's really sort of a sliding scale. And depending on the situation, we might say that the molecule is polar when its bonds are 0.6, but we might say it's nonpolar at 0.6, just depending on the behavior of the molecule itself. Right? So, or if we see something, you know, in an experiment, we make an observation that we might say we lend that to the polarity, even though the bond is only a 0.4. Hopefully that kind of makes sense. All right, so again, it's a sliding scale. Now, if I'm looking for an extreme answer, then I'm gonna give you an extreme situation, right? So if I want you to say it's an ionic compound based upon its electric negativities, then I'm gonna make sure you're in the three area, right? 2.5 to 3.0, I'm gonna make sure you're down there extreme. If I want you to say it's covalent nonpolar, it's going to be like 0 or 0 0.1, 0 0.2 maybe. It's not going to be somewhere in that gray area. If I want your answer to be polar covalent, I'm going to make sure that it comes out to like, you know, 1.0. That way you're not kind of wondering, uh, maybe it's gray, I'm not sure. Okay, so again, you don't have to worry about the numbers, you just have to know what to do with them. So you'll take them, you'll subtract them, get that absolute value, apply that to the bond. And that's going to say if the bond is polar, nonpolar, or ionic. All right, so which of the following species has the least polar bond? So, like, that's the other way I can play it, right? So now you don't have to worry about whether it's polar or nonpolar. You're looking for the least polar of these. So HCl, HF, HI, or HBr. Well, if we go back and look at that periodic table, we see the electronegativities go down as we come down the group. And we're looking for the difference. Hydrogen's gonna remain the same number, which means iodine being at the bottom of that list has to be the one that's gonna give us the least polar bond. So again, using electronegativities, the change in the electronegativity will be the absolute value of the two subtracted.
the difference in electronegativity then, measure of ionic character of the bond. And again, it's a sliding scale. Okay. Notice the zero would be a covalent bond going all the way to 3.0 means you have a completely ionic bond. Somewhere in there, we'll say where the character is. So here you can see we're saying we have a 50% ionic character that actually falls at about one point, what is that, seven maybe, right? So when we say it's nonpolar, we usually say it's about 0.5. So you can see down in here, we're still in that sort of flat section of that curve. So using electronegativities then, nonpolar covalent bonds, that means there's no real difference in those in that electronegativity. Ionic character of the bond would be the degree to which the bond is polar. And again, you know, the change in electronegativity is about a 1.7. It means it's mostly ionic. So again, I said the rule of thumb would be 2.0. I'm not going to put you in a gray area here. I'm going to make you commit so that you can say that it's ionic by making sure that difference is above 2. Okay. The more electronegative element almost completely controls the electron. So once we get to that point, it's saying that that electronegative element, that nonmetal, is probably attracting that electron, that density, most of the time. Now, if your EN is less than 0.5, that means it's going to be mostly pure co covalent. Okay. It's spending equal time in both atoms. And of course, nonpolar means percent less than 5% ionic. So there's hardly any ionic character at all. So again, these are just rough ideas of where these lines are. It really is a sliding scale, and depending on the situation, we may say something is ionic or non-ionic non or covalent or polar, non-polar, just depending on the situation. All right, so the result in this is elements in the same region of the periodic table. So in other words, if I have two non-metals, they'll have similar electronegativities. That means you're going to have more covalent character to their bond. Right. Elements in different regions of the periodic table, in other words, a metal and a non-metal, means we're going to have a higher ionic nature to the bond. So reactivities of elements related to the electronegativities, to most easily oxidized are your ones in red, to least easily oxidized being the transitions. Right. There's definitely a parallel between the electronegativity and its reactivity. So if you're starting to notice that, then obviously you're not by yourself. If you didn't notice it, hopefully you'll go back, you'll think about this a little bit and you'll see, oh yeah, there is a parallel there. The tendency to undergo redox reactions is related to its electronegativity. All right, so reactivities of elements related to electronegativities. Metals, we have a low electronegativity and it's very easy to oxidize them. And this should make sense. Right, so electronegativity is measuring how bad an atom wants an electron. Oxidation was measuring how easily they want to get rid of their electrons. So metals we know want to get rid of them. That means they don't want to obtain more. It means their electron uh, electronegativity will be low, but they're going to be very easy to oxidize. They're going to be very easy to take the electron away from them. If it's a high electronegativity, it wants the electron it's going to be harder to oxidize. Reactivity then decreases across the row as the electronegativity increases. For nonmetals, their oxidizing power increases. So again, you're just playing the, the game with the terms for oxidation and reduction and looking at how that's going to relate to the electronegativity. All right, so your turn. Predict the type of bonding, covalent or ionic, in the following. Magnesium chloride, carbon tetrachloride, iron three oxide, sulfur dioxide, carbon disulfide. So we know magnesium chloride should be ionic. So that means we're looking at A, C, or D. For carbon tetrachloride, we should have covalent. So that's going to be either C or D. Iron three oxide, it should be ionic, which gives us D. And then sulfur dioxide should be covalent and carbon di disulfide should also be covalent. All right, so we're gonna stop there. The next thing we're gonna do is looking at trawling those Lewis structures. So I know this seems a long segment to not be at trawling Lewis structures when that's when we said we were starting out to do. But we had to get electronegativity in there so we'd understand polarity.
because once we start drawing the Lewis structures, you're going to be asked to figure out where the polarity might be and whether or not it's going to be a polar molecule. So we'll pick up in the fourth segment with drawing Lewis structures.